Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Um, we know people are joining us from all different parts of the world, and we really appreciate you being here with us. I would like to welcome you back to our Water Productivity Masterclass Series brought to you by the Water Pips Project. We are in week four of six, and we really appreciate those who have joined us so far for, for weeks one, two, and three. And if you're new, we also welcome you and, and hope you enjoy the webinar this week. I am Lauren Zielinski. I'm from IHE Delft, working on the Water Pit Project, and I'm joined by Abraham Abishek from Meta Meta, and we will be uh, moderating this webinar today. So for those who are new, the Water Pit Project stands for Water Productivity Improvement in Practice, and it's a project that is funded by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs with the goal of improving uh, water productivity in the agricultural sector. So we are bringing together groups that focus on water science and water management for most of our activities. And these activities are being led by IHE Delft, Institute for Water Education, Wageningen University in Research, and Meta Meta Research and Communication. So we really appreciate you all being here, and we would like to know more about you. So if you could introduce yourself in the chat and put your name, the organization you work for, and the country. We're really interested to see where you all come from. And if you have been here before, you'll know that all of the participants will be on mute, but we encourage you to engage with us in the chat box. If you have comments or questions during the webinar, please put them in the chat, and we will collect them for the Q&A session at the end. So again, we are on week four of six. So our first webinar focused on introducing the content of water productivity and how to monitor it. Weeks two and three, we focused on using the WAPOR portal for monitoring water productivity. And now we are focusing on a specific crop and with some case studies in Africa. So we're focusing on sugarcane production and water, product water productivity issues around sugarcane production. Next week, we will learn about factors, socioeconomic factors around water productivity. And our final week, we will be using AquaCrop to monitor water productivity, which is a, another uh, open software from FAO. And if you would like to rewatch the webinar from today and download the presentations or find additional information, uh, you can always go to the project website. So that is waterpip un-ihe.org, or you can go to the waterchannel.tv, and you'll be able to find the information from there. Or, you know, if you missed, if you would like to see the information from the previous weeks, you can also see that information there as well. So please share it with colleagues who might have been unable to attend, and uh, and we're happy to answer questions as well through the through the website. So the agenda today is is quite full. We have many colleagues joining us. So first, we will show a recorded interview from our colleague in the field, Avera Jirma, and he's going to talk about the experience of producing sugarcane in Ethiopia. Next, we will hear from our colleague, Taya Alamayeru, who will talk from the sugar industry perspective about different priorities, opportunities, and challenges. Next will be Professor Peter van der Zaff from IHE Delft, and he will look at the implication of sugarcane expansion in a river basin context. Next will be Abebe Chukala, also from IHE Delft, who will discuss intensification versus expansion in sugarcane production. And then our colleague from Sess van der Hav, Martin van der Stuken, will talk about sugar beets. We'll start with a short video about sugar beet breeding, and then he will go into more detail about how sugar beets can help us with sustainable agriculture. And again, at the end, Abraham and I will moderate a question and answer session. So we will not pause in between the presentations, but if you have a question, please put it in the chat. Abraham and I will collect them, and we will put them on the screen during the Q&A session and have our expert panel um, have a discussion about them. So I think with that, I'm going to quickly introduce the first video. Uh, so we'll be hearing from Abera Jirma, who is a Civil and Irrigation Works Division Manager at the Wonji Shoa Sugar Factory in Ethiopia. And he's going to talk about his experiences from the field. The interview was done by our colleague Youssef Sharonet, who is a Meta Meta 
colleague in Ethiopia. So we a big thank you to him uh, for doing this for us. And please note that we did have to shorten the interview a little bit to fit in the time with our webinar. But if you would like to watch the full video, it will be available on the waterchannel.tv as well as the project website. So I think with that, we can start the video. Okay, my name is Abel Agrma. I am working in uh, Wenjishua Sugar Factory uh, in the position of uh, Civil and Irrigation Work Division Manager. I am working here from junior level to senior management level for the last 20 years. The new factory capacity is double of the old two factory. It is six thousand ton per day cane crushing capacity regarding to sugar cane annually uh, the sugar uh, factory has a capacity to produce one million quintal of white sugar but now uh, from year to year uh, we are planning one million quintal of sugar per year uh, we cannot meet the target. Uh, for example, in this year, we are producing 635,000 quintal of sugar. It is almost 80% of our target. Last year's also similar. Last year's, before last year's, it is similar. So our target is uh, lay in 17 to 80 percent of target. We cannot still meet 100 percent of our target. This new development has very great impact on our uh, development. In phase two, Wolenchiti uh, and uh, Bofa area is planned. Uh, somewhat, we are in progress to construct a, 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 a irrigation infrastructure, but due to very social, political, and other problems, we cannot meet that project accordingly. That project also affects our target. As a big in Sugar Corporation, Sugar Corporation also plan 10 new sugar factors both agricultural and factory. That also has uh, a great impact on our target. In the way uh, that there is a very great financial problem. Mm -hmm. Due to that financial problem, we are not able to purchase the uh, required resources like fertilizer, herbicide and other input materials according to our squeeze. Due to that, our uh, productivity of cane is reduced, then finally it affects our target. So uh, both in, in within the company and within the sugar company, uh, expansion project affects our target. According to the irrigation network, there are three categories. Mm -hmm. The first one is uh, the furrow irrigated land, which is owned by the state proper. The other one is pressurized irrigation system, which is owned by outgrowth farmer association. The third one is hydro flu irrigation uh, infrastructure. It's also owned by uh, the outdoors farm. There are five soil classes, five soil classes. According to the five soil classes, ratoning also different, uh, fertilizer application also different. For example, the A1 soil category, uh, which is black cotton soil, the uh, first 
planting is harvested after two years, then the first raton after one year, then the second raton after two years, the third raton after one year. Then after that, it uprooted and the land is remaining as it is for four months. After four months, the land preparation activity is started. Okay. Then new planting is continued. So in A1, one planting season is five, uh, six years. Planting two, two years, first raton one years, second raton two years, third raton one years. So it uh, continue for six years. After six years, the sugar cane is uprooted and ready for the new planting activities. In A2, uh, it is for eight years, then the light C1 soil cycle, it remain for, it, con it uh, remain to 10 years. After 10 years, new planting activity is uh, conducted. The major uh, uh, difference is due to fertility of soil. Mm -hmm. The state on so the state on farm is its fertility is very low. It needs uh, more application of fertilizer. The one GT one is the soil type is very fertile. But as previously mentioned, we are put the same type of we have the same type and amount of fertilizer is applied in the state owned farm and also all mm -hmm. This is the main the main the main difference for land productivity. The second one is the system by itself makes the difference. Mm -hmm. In uh, cultural practice, especially in application of water, uh, in state owned uh, farm, we cannot manage the water application. Uh, it is similar to flooding, but the Duduta one is, it is more manageable because it is more technology system is applied. The OLNGT also somewhat better than the state owned. It is hydrofluum, we cannot, we can manage better. This one also make a difference for the land productivity. In the state-owned uh, farmers, the company uh, by itself arrange a rehabilitation project to rehabilitate the, the whole system, the irrigation, uh, the mechanization, every system arranges the rehabilitation project uh, that rehabilitation project reduces or increases the land productivity by a certain amount. But we cannot continue that rehabilitation year to year. Mm -hmm. We are stopping that rehabilitation project at some period. So the problem is now also continue. That is one major uh, taken by the company to reduce the problem. The second one is the, our, our division also try to make some measures to reduce these problems. For example, we are trying to measure the amount of water entered to the fields. It also makes some differences, but uh, we, we cannot meet our target. We are trying to line canals. By another orders, we are trying to change earthen canals to concrete canals to minimize the seepage losses and also earthen canals to hydro flu. But uh, this also makes some difference that we cannot make our, now the target. So we are trying to make 
some measures in state-owned farms. Fertilizer application, we must uh, up, up, upgrade your fertilizer application, your herbicide application, your water application. So the recommendation of the company is to improve our cultural practice. But still, we cannot improve our cultural practice due to different reasons. In our state-owned uh, farmers, uh, water, the drainage, the drainage of the farm by itself is silted up. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to upgrade our drainage facilities. That is our target. Also, we are conducting that activities, but the our plan and our activity is not matched. We are not do according to our plan due to financial problem. So we cannot alleviate the problem 100%. Uh, by another order, we try to give paracetamol to our uh, fields. The problem is continue, the problem is continue with ours. Also, we are trying to uh, improve the, by developing a checklist to follow up the cultural practice. At a certain time, we are stopping following according to the checklist. No. In our opinion, the center pivot irrigation systems is more, more productive than the other one. Because, because the center pivot irrigation system is less affected by human, a uniform distribution of water is applied the, in the sugar cane. So this center pivot irrigation system is more productive than the other irrigation system. Operational maintenance costs are different in different irrigation systems. For example, in center pivot irrigation systems, one person can manage one center pivot. In other words, one center pivot means 75 hectares. So one person can manage 75 hectares for eight hours. In furrow irrigation systems, 1.2 hectares is managed per day per three persons. Mm -hmm. Look the difference. There is a great difference. That three person, one day, but one day, 75 hectares, one person. This is operational. Uh, in regarding to spare part, the center pivot irrigation system needs almost zero spare part. The only one, uh, maybe in some two or one month after the tire is reduced, we fill the air. Mm -hmm. Regarding to the drag line, we broken the sprinkler aid. We are trying to uh, uh, exchange the hose. There is very difficult to manage in drag line sprinkler. And also we are investing many uh, Ethiopian birds, uh, in foreign birds. Uh, to purchase that infield material. So the center pivot irrigation system, operational and maintenance cost is minimum than the drag line irrigation systems. Operational cost of furrow is very high than the drag line and the center pivot irrigation systems. Regarding the two water application, there is no any difference mm -hmm. uh, in any uh, irrigation systems. Let's come to this state-owned systems. Mm -hmm. We can apply the water timely and required amount, and also in uh, pressurized irrigation systems. The only problem, mm -hmm. one is application of uh, this availability of electricity. Mm -hmm. In pressurized irrigation systems, Mostly, 
um, electricity are not available from the EBCO side. Due to that, due to that problem, uh, we are not apply amount of water at a required time. But the state-owned one is we cannot we can apply the amount of water as required. There is sufficient amount of water in our for our our company. We can get a sufficient amount of water. Mm -hmm. But uh, a certain month uh, May and uh, June, especially May, uh, we we face a shortage of water, a shortage of water. Um, otherwise, we, we can get sufficient amount of water for the our farmers. For expansion one, mm -hmm. expansion one, we are not we are not have sufficient amount of water mm -hmm. for expansion one. For but the constructed, the existing farmers, we can assure a sufficient amount of water from our. We have one main, one weathering station in our state uh, farmers. Uh, we are measuring temperature, both maximum and minimum, wind speed, humidity, relative humidity, and sunshine hours per day. No. But the problem is we cannot use these data for irrigation scheduling. Uh, we are now we are trying uh, to use the weathering data per three months. How, how, what about our irrigation efficiency? We are uh, using the irrigation, uh, the pump or the amount of water according to the weathering data. So uh, day to day activity, we are not translate the data accordingly. That is the major problem. Regarding to this weather measuring uh, activities, we are trying to measure the discharge amount of water from Osh River only. Mm -hmm. In stand on uh, in stand on farmers, we are measuring the amount of water that is discharged from Awash. Mm -hmm. And also the data is similar. Wagate you also similar, Wolanjiti also similar. So we are trying to compare, trying to compare mm -hmm. within a three months period, this amount of water. Are you applying the water according to the weather or not? We are only compare this amount. Most probably the state owned farm is use more waters than the required one. The other farmers are lesser amount of water is used than the required one. So we are measuring only at the input side, at the beginning side. We are not trying to measure the water within the state. We are not trying. Our company Basically, regarding to this uh, uh, water, uh, there are very challenging. There are very, very challenging. Because starting from the, the assumption for uh, or the value to give water is very less. That value, that assumption makes uh, our effort less. Simply, this water is coming from somewhere, pass through uh, our fields. We are trying to pump from uh, that one. So it is a plenty, it assumes it is a plenty resource. Uh, we can, we can, uh, we cannot, we can use according to our uh, desire. This is the assumption. But if we give, we give the value to that water resource, if you give the value to water resource, we are trying to create some measuring structures, some uh, means to improve that uh, 
amount of water. Simply, the first one, the cost is very minimal. Mm -hmm. So we can pay for any amount of water. We are discharging many amount of water from our river. That amount of water is not using for sugarcane. It also loss through seepage, loss through uh, misuse of human person. Mm -hmm. We are also paying because due to its payment is less, we are paying. So if we are paying, the assumption is we can use any amount of water. So this is a very challenging problem. That is why we are not plan to measure our water productivities. Mm -hmm. no. This is one challenging in our company. Mm -hmm. So I would like to thank Abero Jirma for sharing his thoughts and his experiences on sugarcane production in the field. As, as we all know, it, it's very complicated to run big estates like that, and there's many considerations that go into it. And he makes lots of connections between the physical conditions, so the soils and natural rainfall, uh, the operations and maintenance of the infrastructure, so around the, the different types of irrigation, but then also the motivation around the economics of water. Um, but it goes to show that having more information about how to increase efficiencies could also help um, reduce some of the complexity around managing such a, such a system. So big thank you again to Abera and then also our colleague Yusuf for recording that interview. And if you would like to watch the entire interview, again, you can see it on the WaterPIP website or the waterchannel.tv. So now we will move on from the field to the sugar industry perspective. So Dr. Taya Alamayehu will talk to us about this in his presentation. Uh, you may not see him on the video due to the internet connection, but we're very excited to have him here. So thank you, doctor. Hi, Taya, you could begin your presentation now. Uh, Taya, do you see your, he's dropped down. Looks like he might have been disconnected. Oh, he's back, okay. <clears> Taya, <throat> hey, can you hear us? Are you ready to start? Hi, Taya, could you? Begin um, if you see your presentation, or let us know if you don't see it. See what could you start with the presentation? It looks like we're having a, a little bit of, of technical difficulties, but I think. Um, until we get Taya back, uh, Simon Shavalking will will start the presentation, um, and then when we get Taya back, he can jump in again. Simon, I think we're having a little trouble with your microphone. Well, Abraham, maybe what we can do while we figure out the technical issues, we can move on to yeah, uh, C1 will be over here in a second. He'll be presenting yeah. from my computer, so. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, sorry for that, uh, but yeah, the, the connection does sometimes uh, stop. Um, so whilst we're getting back to time, I would like to uh, continue um, uh, with his uh, presentation about um, 
the, the larger picture within Ethiopia, development and operation of the sugar industry. I won't be able to say a lot more than the filled content of this presentation. Um, uh, what also already came forward from the, uh, uh, the interview with uh, Abera was the high potential for sugarcane production in Ethiopia. Um, well, um, as you may know or may not know, uh, Ethiopia is blessed with a lot of hectares of uh, irrigable land, uh, a lot of water sources. Um, but uh, at this moment, actually, the total developed area of uh, land, uh, particularly with regards to irrigation, is still very minimal. Um, for sugarcane, taking only 2.5% of that uh, area. Um, However, the government of Ethiopia is very much uh, looking at uh, uh, two dyna uh, several dynamics. One, a very quickly growing population, as well as a population that requires a lot more sugar, a population that is in development. We're very much looking at how can we expand uh, production within Ethiopia and uh, substitute uh, import. Uh, so sugar development sector is actually one of the major sectors in which uh, projects are taking place. You may have heard it through the news and uh, publications that there's uh, projects and uh, being established all over, factories as well. And uh, potentially, and that is the idea of the Ethiopian government, it will very much contribute to the economy, also in terms of uh, it being an export product. Um, so there's high, high attention towards the uh, sh sugar uh, industry, uh, the sugar uh, growing. Um, the policy that has been set out, uh, because there have been a lot of problems in import, export, policy that has been set out is really to manage the imports, which always have to uh, be bought using that, that uh, very valuable foreign currency, um, and to steer towards creating exports. And again, as I mentioned, uh, tackling the consumption within the country. Um, the sector as it is, is very attractive for uh, investments. Uh, there's a high potential for development, as I mentioned. Only 2.5% of, of the land has actually been developed. Um, at this moment, uh, actually last year, since 2019, uh, the government has also uh, started a policy shift uh, not with regards to the import-export, but more towards privatizing. As came forward from the previous presentation, all the current sugar production is state-owned, managed. Uh, um, and at this moment, uh, so since last year, the government is really looking at, privati uh, at privatizing the, the sector. Um, and um, uh, actually, since uh, January 2019, 30 companies have shown interest and presented their profiles to work in joint ventures with the Ethiopian Sugar Corporation. Um, this is just a quick overview of um, uh, all the potential irrigation sites for sugarcane development. It's, uh, yeah, it's a large amount, um, and um, uh, I believe several of these have already been developed. But it also, overall, you can see that it's, it really goes into the hundred thousands of hectares in terms of suitable area. Um, with regards to the development status, so sugarcane has been cultivated by small farmers since a long time, 16th century. Uh, with regards to large scale, since the past uh, 70 years, so in the 50s of the last uh, century, the experience started with commercial farming. It started actually at Wonji, so uh, at the, the sugar industry uh, estate where Abera uh, was uh, interviewed from. Um, and it was actually started by a, uh, a Dutch-based company. Uh, that back then, the initial production was 140 tons of sugar per day. Um, in 2014, um, uh, the status of amount of factories was only that there were three, and they were producing 75,000 tons of sugar per annum. Um, uh, yeah, from, from a total of um, uh, 28,000 hectares. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll have numbers there uh, a bit later. Um, 
At this moment, 10 huge sugar development projects are that already mentioned require high investments and are under construction in various lowland areas of the country. Um, and that's an important point that I uh, um, want to mention. Um, is what Abera is actually reflecting on is that the new developments are very much impacting the, the current uh, sugar estates and their sort of rehabilitation, uh, so their intensification of pro, uh, produce. Uh, at this moment, about 103,000 hectares of land is covered with sugarcane um, uh, under eight operational factories. Uh, production has passed 500,000 tons. And there is power generation, uh, millions of liters of ethanol. So there's not only uh, sugar, obviously, coming from uh, sugarcane, but there's ethanol um, uh, production as well. Um, when all these projects, the 10 projects that are mentioned, are completed, uh, the intention is that the pr sugar production is boosted to 3.9 to 4.717 million tons. And ethanol production would be 181 million liters. Um, uh, as well as that the factories would contribute to 709 megawatts of electric power to the national grid. Um, the, um, the amount of labor actually involved is uh, uh, tremendous. There's 15,000 members organized in 70 sugarcane outgrowing and providing associations on 17,000 hectares of land. Um, So back to the development uh, of sugarcane, uh, the government goal is actually to satisfy local demand and become one of the top uh, 10 sugar exporting countries. As I mentioned, there is quite a lot of import going on. There is an increasing population and increasing demand, increasing wealth, etc., for sugar. Um, and so primary goal is to satisfy local demand. Um, however, the, well, the sector does have quite a lot of challenges to meet these goals. Um, as I mentioned, the growing population um, uh, uh, has just meant that the sugar demand uh, has not been able to uh, meet the supply. Um, and that really relates to the implementation capacity, um, the finance available, uh, foreign exchange, uh, spare parts as well as machinery supply, which always was highlighted by Abera's presentation, actually, that you know, all the spare parts for the drag lines, etc., all have to be bought with foreign, uh, a foreign currency, and that is a very big challenge. Um, also a challenge is water shortage during drought years. Uh, good to add. I mean, obviously, we're presenting Ethiopia as a, a country that is very uh, uh, well suited for agricultural production, but there is the uh, uh, challenge of uh, drought periods, drought spells. Um, also in areas that are being irrigated, uh, uh, salinity is a challenge, as well as waterlogging, uh, or vice versa, waterlogging and salinity. Uh, this, as also highlighted by Abera, uh, is due to poor management, uh, water management practices, drainage, amount of irrigation, and the underlying soil conditions. Um, there's high runoff in several areas in which uh, um, sugarcane is actually being produced. And there's quite an amount of liquid waste or sewage from uh, processing uh, plants, uh, which in turn affects uh, um, uh, river systems, right, where there's uh, the, the effluent running to. Um, Another challenge is this lack of improved technologies uh, that can actually uh, improve the existing production. Uh, also, uh, looking at cane varieties, uh, the uh, challenge of prevalence of diseases and pests. Um, and I think, again, here, uh, it, it also reflecting back, it, that, that finance problem is sort of a reoccurrent thing, uh, right? What Abera also mentioned is that tackling diseases and pests, getting the modern cane varieties, etc., are very much a, a, a plan and a priority, but uh, they are uh, difficult in terms of implementation. Um, from the numbers also presented from Abera, it is possible to cultivate 162 tons of sugarcane uh, per hectare on an, within an average of 15 months. Uh, uh, 
Um, there are uh, plenty of suitable soils. Um, there's adequate uh, uh, water, um, not considering the drought. Um, and the average uh, sugarcane production per month uh, would amount to more or less 9 to 11 within Ethiopia, comparing that to 6 to 8 tons per hectare per month, uh, which, is, which are common in other parts of the world. Um, but as mentioned, uh, there is a uh, evident gap between the potential yield and the yields that are actually being achieved so far. Um, land productivity itself is uh, dependent, uh, so within Ethiopia, on uh, the agroclimate regimes. So um, uh, uh, within Ethiopia, there's obviously different agroclimatic zones. This affects the uh, length of cropping uh, periods, um, also the different water and soil conditions. Um, uh, and with that, with that, the sugar stage in lower altitudes. Uh, are relatively more productive due to warmer temperature and more fertile fluvial soils, right in the um, uh, in the plains of various rivers. Um, although, so although it is possible to produce, um, referring back to the figures on the previous slide, uh, between nine and eleven tons of sugarcane uh, per month, um, poor land and land and water management practices are lowering land productivity of a significant significant portion of the current farms. With regards to water productivity, water productivity largely, largely depends on the zones again, uh, soil conditions, uh, and the irrigation water management, including the amounts of water, uh, the irrigation technology, and the irrigation scheduling. And as Abera also already mentioned, this is really a challenge in schemes where we're only using uh, for example, furrow uh, systems, as opposed to systems that are more uh, manageable, uh, like with hydro flumes or with drag lines or with center pivots. The water productivity um, um, one moment. Uh, So going back to the well, uh, back to the third point, uh, the existing sugar mills, particularly in Wanji Shoa, where uh, the the sugar mill uh, that Abera was actually pre presenting, uh, and another one which we are investigating, uh, looking into as well, is Fincha. Um, they do not attain the best, or let's say, state of the art design standards and efficiency. And um, um, uh, although they are required to uh, be replaced or upgraded in order to improve, you know, as also highlighted by the research that has been conducted, the studies, as also highlighted by what Abera was mentioning. Um, with regards to the application of WAPOR, um, uh, managing extensive cane farm with conventional method is a big challenge. Uh, as Abera also highlighted, measuring water uh, that is going in is possible, but within the system, particularly within furrow uh, irrigated systems, it sort of gets lost, and it's very difficult to actually see where water is going. Um, as farm size increases, modern management tools are available, um, and there with also uh, irrigation, uh, irrigation in fields is better manageable, uh, manageable and uh, crops can be monitored more appropriately. WAPR in this could, WAPR the um, uh, online open source database uh, using remote sensing products can actually help in monitoring growth and, um, and uh, yeah, looking at where there is stresses in plants, which could also be from diseases. So remote sensing in that sense, the WAPR uh, uh, portal, yes, could be a vital tool for uh, helping um, uh, irrigation scheme managers such as Abera as well. Um, um, and within Ethiopia, there's ample opportunity to actually collaborate with a lot of different partners. Uh, so the partners here mentioned are Wonji Shoa, the sugar factory, uh, a, a list of other um, sugar-producing industries, such as Metahara, Fincha, uh, etc., they would be very eager to look into 
the opportunity of uh, looking at irrigation, water supply, the adequacy, the equity within a system. Um, and um, actually, what was not mentioned by Abera, but Wanji Sugarcane Factory also hosts the National Research Center for Sugarcane Production. Um, Well, with regards to the Ethiopian Sugarcane Corporation, it was established in 2010. It plays a le leadership role in the development, management, and marketing of sugar. So that's an important thing that I didn't mention. The corporation manages all the uh, uh, sugar estates, but it's also directly involved itself in the marketing of sugar and all its byproducts. So they are also the ones that are distributing uh, sugar uh, for uh, consumer retail as well as uh, distributing sugar towards uh, industries that need sugar. Um, and um, yeah, that, that's I think what I can say about that. Uh, also looking at the time, um, yeah, I think that that uh, is more or less what I um, can say. Uh, yeah, uh, I. Uh, Hope uh, that I've done a bit of justice to the uh, tire. He will be available also for questions a bit later on. Thank you, Simon, for taking over the last minute. I know Taya has been active in the chat, so even if he couldn't present his voice, he's still active uh, in the discussions. And he will be available for the Q&A session at the end. So please let us know if you have questions. Put them in the chat box, and we will bring them up then. So thank you again, Simon. And I think that's a nice overview of the industry level application of sugarcane and the expected expansions. But uh, some questions that have come up already is what does that mean for a river basin context? Where does this water come and how does it impact other parts of a river basin? So now we will move on to Peter van der Zach and he will talk about this topic uh, shortly if we can just, perfect, okay. Yep, so Peter, I will let you uh, once it loads, you can. Thank you, uh, Lauren. It's a great pleasure to uh, to give this presentation. Uh, my background is uh, irrigation engineering from Wageningen University. The first African river that I worked on is sugarcane dominated in Kumati, and I did my PhD in Mexico on an irrigation scheme that also was dominated by sugarcane. So it's uh, it's nice to, uh, to take part in this webinar. Now, I was asked to, to say something about sugarcane expansion and its implications for water use in a river basin context. Now, I want to be a bit, bit pro, pro, uh, how do you call it? Uh, um, can I move the slides myself? Yeah. Yes, the, the, the alternative title is sugarcane expansion, the basin manager's headache. And that sets perhaps a bit the tone. Now, this is the overview of my, my, my presentation. First, some facts, then I focus on four typical characteristics, or four characteristics that are typical for sugarcane with immediate implications for water management. And I will discuss a few options of uh, how to resolve those. And I look forward to, uh, to, to the discussion afterwards. Um, this is the a graph from foul stuff. So we don't know how reliable these data are, but the green line is the, the, the yield in uh, tons per hectare. And uh, the blue line is the expanse, the area harvested. So you see a nice increase. There's an increase of 1% to 2% per year. Uh, the average yield increases, but very slowly. It looks uh, steep, but it is not so steep. It depends on the scale. Now, in Africa, we see also the, the expansion of the area cultivated and harvested. But unfortunately, we see that there is uh, a decrease in, uh, in crop yields. So something uh, has to be done. And then one more fact, perhaps of interest, and the green line here is the the, the sugar price, world market price, and the, the red line is the maize price for, for a comparison. So market price of, of, of sugar is very volatile. 
Um, now I turn to four characteristics of sugarcane that are important for water uh, management. Most of the sugarcane is cultivated as an industrial crop. And I'll come back to the implications. Uh, we all know that sugarcane is relatively a large water thirsty crop. It is, of course, a perennial crop, and it is not a seed crop. And that is relevant. Now, first, sugarcane is an industrial crop. It requires a mill, and thus it requires some minimum scales of production. And typically, operations are centralized, through, typically through an estate. And this influences the social and economic relationships between the state staff, the estate owners, the cane cutters, the outgrowers, oftentimes, as has been mentioned before, water managers and others. Often, but of course Ethiopia is the big exception, sugarcane production has a colonial history and a history of forced labor and even of slavery. Currently, there, is, there are strong sugar lobbies promoting the, the production and consumption, consumption of sugar and sugarcane, uh, and this should not be underestimated. There's a huge lobby in Brussels to fight against the tax on sugar. Although sugar is uh, in, uh, in the European context uh, uh, a kind of a pandemic, uh, creating all kinds of unhealthy uh, situations. At this moment, we have five deaths per day in Holland from the pandemic, COVID pandemic, and we have more than 100 related to uh, heart diseases and things related to uh, obesitas. And further, there are all kinds of subsidies that distort the market for sugar and ethanol, which complicates matters. So this is just a bit of a background. Eh? Okay, we all know that water is a thirsty crop. We saw these this incredible numbers for Ethiopia. Uh, uh, I'm always thinking, okay, I'm one meter 90 high, so I will drown in the water layer that is required for, for a year's uh, crop in, uh, in, uh, for sugar cane. Um, sugarcane is a perennial crop. Have you heard the ratoons? Uh, typically, a crop is standing there for five to ten years. Uh, this means that it fixes water requirements of the area planted with sugarcane for several years ahead. And that's a very important uh, implication for basin management. And fortunately, sugarcane is not a seed crop. It doesn't need to flower before it can produce its good unlike, for instance, all the grains. So you first, for the grains, you first have to put water on the, on the crop before you can harvest anything. Not so with the sugarcane, and this has an implication that during the yield formation stage, more or less 150 to 300 days after planting or retuning, you can do deficit irrigation with limited damage. Okay, implications for water management. The first three characteristics that I mentioned make sugarcane a headache for the basin manager. In particular, in closing basins where sugarcane continues to expand. And because it fixes the water requirements also in dry years or even in dry years. Now, let's turn to some data from Faustat again, now from Mozambique and Eswatini. And these are countries which have a lot of sugarcane, also on the Incomati, which I've mentioned before. And you see that uh, there, is an ex there is an expansion, where is my thing? Can you use this, eh? Oh, no. oh yeah. And there's a, an expansion of sugarcane in Mozambique, and also in, uh, in uh, Eswatini, that's also known as Swaziland. Um, Swaziland has very good operations, and you see they have high, stable yields of around 100 tons per, per, per hectare. And uh, in Mozambique, it's, it's really fluctuating, but overall increasing. Anyway, now I have to move to the next slide. Yes. Um, in such closing basins, problems are inevitable during periods with below average water availability. 
as the flexibility is reduced due to the sugar cane because the, of its perennial crop and its high water use requirements. So what are options for water management to solve this, uh, this, this, uh, this rigidity in the system? You can only solve this by institutional and regulatory uh, measures in closing basins because the physical measures like putting more dams in is, is in most cases not any longer economically and practically feasible. So possible options for the basin manager define a cap on the, the, the acreage of, of, of perennial crops allowed vis-a-vis -vis the annual crops. Enforce deficit irrigation of sugarcane during droughts. And in times of severe droughts, allow seasonal transfers of water permits between irrigators of annual and irrigators of perennial crops, meaning that the, 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 the perennial crop owners will pay a compensation to the annual crop growers to say, okay, forgo one year, so one season's crop, and I will give you so much money so that I can use uh, your uh, water permit. Okay, there are probably many more options, and I invite all of you to, uh, to submit your suggestions uh, to solve this problem. Now, in, in conclusion, these options are institutionally demanding and information intensive. They require strong and legitimate institutions, especially because often large interests are at stake in settings with large inequalities. And for instance, uh, I hope I, I don't say anything wrong that, for instance, in Swaziland, one of the biggest uh, owners of the sugarcane estate is the king. So it, is, it will be quite difficult for, uh, for a water ba a basin manager to, uh, to enforce, for instance, deficit irrigation in such a, such a context. But it also holds for large companies who own uh, sugar estates who normally are very powerful and uh, have a large interest. And then the annual crop owners tend to have much less uh, political power. Moreover, these options require reliable information at adequate temporal and spatial scales. And here, perhaps, Vapor and similar products can uh, really play a good role, a positive role. Currently, our water institutions are often not strong enough to seek innovative options, as, as, as I suggested. Try these out, learn, improve, and grow. Also, the legal system may even not allow certain options. In many countries, it is not allowed to uh, temporarily transfer water permits from one permit holder to the next. So, my, con my final conclusion is, there's much work to be done, and I want to thank you for your attention. Thank you. That was a really nice overview, and, and again, a reminder that everything is connected. So, the water that we need for sugarcane has to come from somewhere else, and, and if we don't have enough, who's giving up their water and connects to the politics and public health. And, and it's a really nice reminder that, that it's, it will require many people and many different institutions um, and creative solutions to, to make sure that this industry is sustainable. And so something that kind of touches upon is, okay, if you have a sugar plantation or a sugar estate, how can you make it more productive with the land that you currently have? Uh, so making uh, an intensification of your land, or would you like to expand the amount of land that you have to produce more sugar? So this is a topic that Abebe Chukala will go into further detail about and using some of the data from the WAPOR uh, analysis. Thank you, Laura. Is my voice heard? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you also for the... Yeah, previous presenters, uh, they give a nice presentation. And my presentation will be on intensification versus land expansion in sugarcane uh, production. 
and I will, uh, in fact, uh, yeah, support my 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 uh, presentation with asking some questions, and uh, also they will help me uh, to guide uh, the presentation that I will have till the end. So the first question is: Is the increase in sugarcane production in Africa is it from land expansion or is it from improving productivity? We already have seen uh, uh, Peter, uh, yeah, give uh, answer to this, but I will uh, maybe still ask the same. And then the second question is: What is the potential for intensification on existing land? Is there any potential? What is the third question is what is the implication of intensification on land use and water consumption? So to start from the background, also answering the first question, um, this is the sugarcane production in Africa. To the left is the FEO stat 2005, showing only uh, the production in Africa. And to the right is uh, for 2012, maybe if we zoom in, uh, we could see it's in a larger uh, picture. And then uh, here in the left, uh, you see some countries even uh, either they, they didn't report or maybe there is no sugar uh, yeah, uh, uh, cultivation. But then in the right in 2012, uh, there is yeah uh, uh, areas which uh, start to cultivate. And in fact, if you see both uh, graphs, uh, the country in Africa with the largest sugarcane uh, coverage is in South Africa. But, well, coming to uh, the main question, uh, there is expansion. In fact, just comparing these two, only these two uh, years, 2005 versus 2012, and based on FPO stats uh, data, uh, there is an increase in land expansion by 13%, one three percent And in fact, uh, it's also increasing as, as we speak. The uh, first, second presenter already showed, also from the FAO stats, that showed that there is an increasing trend in uh, production. However, the productivity, again, comparing those two years from FAO stats data, uh, is almost stable or even in showing on average uh, decreasing. So, on average, from 61 ton per hectare per year to about 59 ton per hectare per year. Then answering our first question, so most of the production increase in Africa is coming from land expansion. It's not really from improving productivity. But then the question is, is there a scope for intensification? So uh, most of uh, the, the next presentation and up to conclusion will focus uh, answering those things and also showing uh, how we could analyze uh, towards uh, answering this intensification question. So for that, uh, I zoom in into uh, one of the sugar uh, cane producing country and also a scheme which is called Sinavana in Mozambique. And I will uh, I will focus only on ten, about 10,000 hectare of uh, that Sinavana uh, sugar cane plantation. In fact. This name already uh, have been appearing in the, our previous webinars, so it should be very famous name, Sinavane. And in this, this area, in fact, uh, three uh, or about three irrigation methods are uh, predominant. Uh, that is uh, sprinkler, furrow, and center pivot. So the indication is, is there a scope to intensify within this uh, area, which is Sinavana? This area have almost the same agroclimatic zone. It means that the potential to increase with a climate limit is, uh, or, I mean, it's, it's comparable and also it's possible. So what method and data uh, uh, I have used to answer those things? So data from vapor, vapor data, uh, uh, for those of you know, maybe, who just joined this webinar, uh, VAPOR is a FPO portal to monitor water productivity through open access of remotely sensed driver data. And then we used three layers of this VAPOR data, land class classification, 
uh, actual evapotranspiration, net primary production, and also we supplement this data with local information, which is more about crop season, as well as the scheme boundary and the agronomic parameters. And then we calculated the seasonal water consumption on, and production using those data. And next, we calculate the water and land productivity, followed by identifying what is the productivity target in that area, and then followed by uh, assessing the productivity gaps. And eventually, then we showed how closing productivity gaps have implication to the production as well as implication to water consumption. In fact, this is supported uh, with uh, yeah, calculation equations, which I will explain here. So the biomass uh, in the x-axis here uh, is uh, calculated uh, with the equation explained here in the box. And in the y-axis, uh, we have the biomass uh, water productivity. And if we plot those variables uh, per pixel for the whole the Sinavana area, uh, yeah, we see the orange clouds of pixels. And then from this, if we, uh, can we uh, set a target? Definitely we could set a target. And in this case, we defined it as a 95 percentile of uh, both productivity, biomass as well as water productivity. And then here, where the two lines cross is a productivity target. Then, yeah, once we have the productivity target, the gap was calculated by comparing this productivity target with a productivity at each pixel. So that gives us how much is the productivity gap. And eventually, we calculated the production projection as well as implication on water consumption. And here, at the bottom of my slides, in fact, the whole activities in the green box are there, which will guide also what will be the result. So the next result is what is the land productivity? So the land productivity here plotted for five seasons from 2014-15 up to now. And all those bars showing the biomass ton in ton per hectare per year. At the first three shows in the cluster uh, the biomass at Sinavana for different irrigation technology, furrow uh, followed by center pivot and then uh, the whole scheme. And then the last column shows the yield of sugarcane for Mozambique again from the Sinavana, uh, from the FEO stats. In fact, the difference between those is not purely just it's a different, but rather is because the last one is talking or showing the yield, which it, it means after multiplying the biomass by harvest index. And also the difference is due to his report, that is the yield from the FPO stat for Mozambique is an average over the whole Mozambique area, which includes also rampage. So this is the biomass. And as you could see, the variation is there across technology even also the bar showing the standard deviation across space. So again, uh, uh, this land productivity across space, as you could see, it varies. So it varies from the smallest red, about 50 ton per hectare per year, uh, to more than 100 ton per hectare per year. And also the, the graph in the right shows the distribution function of this uh, biomass across the Sinavana. So it nicely shows the normal distribution where also coloring the values which are above the 95 percentile, which we yeah, said they, they can be as, as a target or beyond those targets. So similarly, we put plots for water productivity and also this water productivity varies uh, across space and also the uh, the 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 yeah the distribution also here shows the normal distribution so with this then can we identify the target so to identify the target we plot in the x axis the biomass and in the y axis the biomass water productivity and then as i already showed if we plot them uh, 
So if we plot them, then uh, we can show, yeah, nicely the relationship between those two and also the target uh, productivity, which is indicated by the uh, dark star. So from this, uh, of course, those dark stars, and I mean those pointers or spots uh, which have productivity more than the 95 percentile are indicated with the green color. And in fact, uh, they are also spread across the whole space in Sinavana. So those spots could be considered for one season as the target. And then yeah, the productivity gap eventually could be calculated by considering the value at, of those targets versus the value at each pixel. So the productivity gap in the left is for biomass gap in the right is the biomass water productivity gaps uh, uh, for five seasons and also uh, yeah for for each irrigation technologies. So as it is seen in the in this picture, the biomass gap is large under furrow irrigation compared to center pivot, for instance. Whereas the water productivity gap is very large or high under area irrigated by uh, center pivot compared to area irrigated by furrow. So then, anyhow, having those gaps, then we calculated the, the uh, or we start to talk about what is by closing gaps. Eh? If we close those average gaps, what it implies? So we have this graph in the X is again uh, the biomass in the Y axis, the biomass water productivity, and it has now additional variable, which is the water consumption. Imagine this is water consumption per year. It's not even 12 months or 15 or 18 months. So we have the actual evapotranspiration in millimeter per year. And as you could see, all those pixels uh, to the left, the reddish one consume less compared to the dark green one. So by improving or closing productivity, we mean that either we move those points in the horizontal uh, to the right, which is following arrow one, then it means that is closing productivity gap, also then consuming more water. Also, it can be following pass two, which means we follow this, uh, since they have the same or almost equal evapotranspiration, it means it is possible to close the productivity gap without any implication to additional or without any implication to water consumption. And there is also a possibility following arrow three, which is a vertical move, where it is possible even to save water while closing productivity. So then if we close those productivity uh, gaps, what is implication to the production? So the implication, well, this is already included uh, indicated per year, uh, the average gap. So there is uh, a possibility to harvest more than 100,000 of ton per hectare per year, I mean ton per the scheme per, per, per year at Sinabana. And also this has, in fact, implication on water consumption, and it might consume uh, about 13.4 millimeter cube, and also uh, a possibility of uh, saving about 1.4 millimeter cube. In fact, this saving doesn't mean that it is saving which could be reallocated for other area or for other sectors, because it's a moisture uh, within the root zone, which is, can be also green water, uh, but if it is a blue one, then there is a possibility even to save the water from the water withdrawal and to apply it. Imagine this water consumption, either uh, additional or saving, is just only comparing the existing irrigation scheme. Because there is a possibility yet to increase the productivity, for instance, by consuming less water than what is in indicated here. For instance, if we are applying mulching and other uh, soil moisture conserving uh, practices, interventions, of course, still uh, the consumption are expected to be less and maybe the saving more. So this will take me to the final conclusion. 
So intensification of Sinavana by closing biomass gap can increase water productivity as well as production and the production can be increased by more than 100,000 tons per, per, per year. This is in fact equivalent to producing for from more than uh, 1,000 hectares or this implies even we are saving about 14% of the existing scheme if we are closing the productivity gap. But this comes with implication to water consumption, but this water consumption uh, would be even higher if the production gain is coming from land expansion. So yeah, we are comparing this, this, this addition and water consumption, but then I would expect to be less if I compare it, uh, the, the yield is increased from the expansion. So subsequent studies could additionally consider, in fact, sucrose content rather than sugarcane, because this is also an indicator for, uh, let's say, sugar production, which is the marketable product from sugarcane. And also it has to do with water shortage. Already Peter nicely said uh, we, we could have uh, the uh, deficit irrigation. So it means it have even a positive, it might have a positive implication to uh, sucrose rather than just uh, indicating there is a reduction into the biomass. So vapor plays an important uh, role. In fact, we have seen this uh, since uh, the first webinar up to now, and uh, it really bridges the data gaps, particularly the spatial details which are unavailable from the additional means of data collection, point data. The first presenter, Abarra already, Abarra Grima already showed they have just one data center to predict, operate, and to do everything. So in such kind of cases, also for future expansion or planning, vapor could really play a, a, a pivotal role. However, validation and accurate interpretation of results, diagnosis of the productivity gap, and formulation of practical solutions can be made if vapor analysis and results are complemented with observed data and the local information. So yes, we have nice data and also let us check it and let us also try to uh, yeah, apply it. That's uh, my final uh, message and uh, thank you. And uh, see you in the question and answer discussion. Thank you, Bebe. That was a really nice review of how WAPOR can be used to determine the impacts of, of incentivization versus expansion. And I think it's a nice tool that, that managers would like to have at their disposal. Um, next, we're, we're running close on time, but next we're going to go to a short video uh, uh, from our final speaker, Martin van der Stuken, who works with Jess van der Hava. Uh, he's a global sugar beet specialist and a project manager for the breeding um, components of, of what they do. And he will discuss sugar beet breeding for drought tolerance and an example about rotation cropping with sugar canes. Uh, so first we will watch. I have eigenlijk van 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 kinderbeen af al een een grote passie en fascinatie voor voor planten en nu een, een job kunnen doen waarbij ik eigenlijk met mijn planten aan de slag kan en proberen meer potentieel uit planten te halen zodat landbouwers er er makkelijker mee kunnen omgaan er meer winst kunnen uithalen vind ik een een, een hele fascinerende uitdaging. Planten hebben water nodig om te groeien, om te produceren. Een gebrek aan water, een, een, een droog jaar, kan, kan opbrengsten in drastische mate doen dalen. Water wordt steeds schaarser. De oorlog voor water, ik denk dat uh, toch wel dichter bij de realiteit zit te komen. En we zien ook dat de, het klimaat grilliger wordt, de seizoenen worden extremer. Dus de variëteiten moeten sowieso robuuster worden. Suikerbieten die stabiel zijn, minder inputs voor stikstof, minder inputs voor water. 
gemaakt in een strategie om eigenlijk suikerbiet competitief te houden met suikerriet. Die voor dezelfde suikeropbrengst te creëren veel meer water nodig heeft. Je weet natuurlijk waar bieten geteeld worden. De bieten zijn vooral gelinkt naar infrastructuur, fabrieken, landraden, waar ze die gewassen teren. Je weet dat in bepaalde landen water perkend is. En het klimaat verandert. Ja. Droogt het steekers, er steeds meer een rol spelen. Dat is natuurlijk de, de veredeling. Het veredelen is de, het kijken in de toekomst. Het mechanisme is dat het gewas meer investeert in zijn wortelstelsel, dus een dieper wortelstelsel maakt, waardoor het eigenlijk droogte vermijdt door eigenlijk diepere waterlagen gaan aan te boren. Het tweede mechanisme is eigenlijk ervoor zorgen dat een plant minder waterbehoeften heeft of minder schade oploopt tijdens periodes van droogtestress. Het tweede mechanisme gaat eigenlijk zowel goed functioneren in droge omstandigheden als in geïrrigeerde omstandigheden om de irrigatievolumes te reduceren. Uh, gewassen die eigenlijk niet inzetten op minder waterverbruik, gewoon efficiënter water kunnen benutten, dat gaat het, 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 het irrigatie, de irrigatiebehoeften niet reduceren, want die hebben nog altijd dezelfde behoefte aan. Droogtetolerante rassen gaan we vooral in gaan zetten in semi-aride gebieden, uh, gaande van West-Europa tot continentaal en Oost-Europa. Ras met minder irrigatiebehoefte, dus een, een verbeterde efficiëntie en watergebruik, gaan we vooral gaan inzetten in uh, geïrrigeerde markten zoals Spanje, uh, Turkije en ook bepaalde markten van Noord-Afrika zoals Egypte en Marokko. combinaties van, van verschillende planten. Dus we gaan eigenlijk de mannelijke delen halen we eruit, dus zeg maar de stuifmeldraden van een takje halen we eruit. En dan zetten we een donor, een andere, van een andere plant, achter een takje, die zetten we erbij. En zo maken we gewoon honderden, duizenden combinaties. Dus hier doen we het uh, in het klein en het gaat steeds verder klein straks zien bij de kans in het groot. Zaad voorbereid en er worden allemaal kleine plotjes, een speciale machine hier op het veld gezaaid. En die zaaien we eigenlijk op een afstand van zo'n 8 centimeter. En die moeten allemaal nog met de hand op één afstand gezet worden, op 20 centimeter. En dan krijg je allemaal kleine, al die rasjes, die rijtjes, worden dan de baan in aan gedaan en met speciale machines geoogst. De kwaliteitsanalyse valt in het land. Dus ik krijg allemaal gegevens. Ja, ik herinner me nog een fijne ervaring met een boer in Italië. Italië had een heel uh, extreem uh, droog seizoen. Het was een van de, van de weinige velden in, in die regio waar het gewas uh, nog echt uh, na de middag um, er nog relatief fris uh, bij stond. En die boer heeft ons uh, heel veel bedankt en ons achteraf laten weten dat zijn uh, opbrengst fantastisch geweest was. Okay, C can you hear me? Okay, um, so th after this little video, which was recorded a long time ago already, but I added a few slides. So I'm Maarten van der Stukke, plant breeder at, at Ses van der Haven, as you could see in the, in the movie already. And I prepared a few slides showing a little bit more specifications of, on the, the other sugar crop, sugar beet. A bit on the work we do on, on drought tolerance and, and the progress that we make on that and then a, a little sidetrack to our tropical beet concept which we 
or rolling out in 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 India, for instance. Um, so sugar beet, it's a it's not a perennial crop in contrast to to sugar cane. So it's sown and then five six months later the roots are harvested, piled up as you can see there on on the picture and transported to the factory and and processed for for sugar extraction. Yule, uh, yields typically are 80 to 100 tons of root yield per hectare and in some regions up to 140 tons and in more stressful regions a little bit less. Sugar content is typically 15 to 20 percent and this results in a, in a wide sugar yield at a factory of let's say 17, 18 ton on average per hectare of, of white sugar. It's also used as, a, as an energy crop just like, like sugar cane. Um, most used byproducts are the leaves, the pulp, the molasses, mainly for, for animal feed purposes. Leaves also as an, as an organic fertilizer. And like mentioned in the video, I think a big difference or a big strength of our crop is uh, the l low water requirements. So even in tropical regions, or in regions with very high irradiation, it never exceeds 8,000 liters per hectare. So on average, the water consumption is, is about three times lower than that of, of sugar cane. And a second interesting characteristic of, of, of sugar beet is that it has a, a very small and, and simple genome, which allows for a very active and dynamic breeding. And this you can see on, on the graph on the right, which shows a bit of the history of, of sugar beet breeding. And then you can see that, we'll try to bring up this, this pointer. Oh, yeah. Here in the 1950s, the average sugar beet variety still yielded around five tons of, of sugar per hectare. While today, like I mentioned before, we are around above 15 tons per hectare. So that's the progress that we make. And we still achieve a yield increase, a sugar yield increase of, of one and a half percent per year. And more and more in, in the last decades, we combine this increase with increasing more and more or bringing in more and more disease tolerance to a multitude of, of diseases that our crop encounters. Um, so sugar beet, it's grown in a bit more than 50 countries. The, the, the main areas are, of course, West Europe, Russia, USA. So it, it's often considered as a the temperate sugar crop, but in fact, it's, there are also substantial, significant growing regions in, in Egypt, Morocco, Iran, Chile, and in fact, uh, even India, and in fact, those are the regions where, where the acreage is expanding mostly. Um, another thing that to bring to your attention is that sugar beet is mainly grown under rain fed conditions, only about 15% of the, of the global sugar beet cultivation takes place under irrigated conditions. So that's, that's also very different from, from cane. Um, this means the fact that it's mainly grown under rain fed conditions is, means that it, it gets exposed to drought and sometimes severe droughts, like was mentioned in the movie already. And here the, the little bar graph shows the impact that drought tolerant varieties and breeding for drought tolerant varieties can have. So current drought tolerant varieties under a severe drought, they lose around 10% in, in, in root yield, while a, a regular drought susceptible variety easily loses 30% in, in, in root yield. So that's a significant impact. Also important is that these drought tolerant varieties can combine this drought tolerant with competitive performance under well-watered conditions as well. So this is an interesting ang angle from a breeder to further work on this, this genetic variation that already exists. And so we have intensified our, our breeding programs for drought tolerance as well. So there we start with identifying the best for performing varieties under drought in the fields, making heavily relying on, on, on remote sensing technologies also for that. And, and those varieties we take to indoor greenhouse screening platforms where we 
actually verify whether this this increased drought tolerance is is triggered by an an improved water use efficiency rather than with a an increased water uptake efficiency because the latter we believe is not really a sustainable strategy because it will only further deplete the the soil water availability so we, we mainly focus on increasing water use efficiency and we experience that this is possible without triggering any yield penalties or so on um, so our goal is to further improve and we are quite ambitious in this further improve the the performance of, of our varieties under these droughts which occur more and more frequently with, with climate change. Uh, then my last slide, I make a little sidestep to our, our tropical beets and a little bit on, on the adoption in the Indian cane regions. So what is a tropical beet? It is first of all a beet, a sugar beet variety that is adapted to the tropical climate, so high temperatures, also high night temperatures compared to, to what you get in the more temperate regions. Um, and of course, if you move into new regions, you experience new diseases. Sclerosium, as you can see here, is on the picture is a, is a nasty example of that. So then we also have to develop uh, and breed for tolerances against these, these diseases. And, and only then you have a variety that, that can sustain profitable growth in the, in the new region. Um, so the feedback that we get from, from the farmers that in, in India that, that have adopted our crop and started growing it is the, the short cycle. So with a cycle of five to six months in a, in a subtropical or tropical region, you can achieve two cropping cycles a year. And the fact that you rotate crops also contributes to, to the maintenance of, of, of good soil quality, good soil integrity, which they also appreciate. And if you, you steer or you plan it well, you can steer your harvest towards a period when, when, when cane supply is lower, uh, providing the, the factory with a, with a prolonged supply of, of sugar bulk source material. Um, another advantage is that sugar beets, the wild ancestor of, of sugar beets originates from, from coastal regions. It, it even grows on the beach, as you can see here on this picture, which means that by nature, it has a high tolerance to, to salinity pressure. And like it was mentioned before, it has a, a quite low water requirement, which is very interesting, of course, from an, from an education perspective. And I also mentioned the breeding progress already, which is rather convenient because if you run into a some kind of an agronomical problem, a new disease or any other issue, there's a very high chance that you can breed to overcome the problem. And then finally, so the, the possible cropping systems that, that have been explored and, and implemented in, in, in India, in, in, in the region where, where sugar beet has been introduced, is the, the most adopted system is one where between uh, the, the renewal of a, of a cane plantation, they fit in uh, a sugar beet cultivation. So have a little rotation with, with sugar beets. Another possibility is that you combine sugar beet with another sugar crop, sweet sorghum, for instance. And the interesting thing about that is then you can combine two sugar crops within one year. Um, and then the third option is what we what we know best from the temperate region is that you rotate sugar beet with cereals or other crops. And in, in more southern regions, subtropical, tropical regions, this has advantage again that you can, can do two croppings within one within year and maintaining a better soil quality by, by rotating. So this was what I had to share. If you want to read a bit more about tropical beet concept and, and related topics, I can refer you to a, a brochure that our communication department made. It's on our website and I'm happy to, to take further questions later on. Thank you, Martin.
it's a really nice presentation and, and a way to show that there's possibilities to diversify your sugar crops and, and not only with sugar cane, but maybe um, changing the seasons uh, with sugar beets or converting to sugar beets if it's more suitable to the conditions. Um, so now I think I would like to thank all of the presenters. We were a little bit over time, so we appreciate everyone who's still with us. We will do a quick question and answer session, but if you have to leave, please visit the, our project website or the water channel.tv to see the question and answer session at a later time. So I think the first question um, talks about, I think getting back to, to Taya's presentation, uh, what would the source of water for the various developments of sugar cane? So would it come from groundwater or dams? I know there has been some discussion in the chat that it's mostly surface diversions, but what would that mean for uh, water security for other sectors, for example? So if, if I is available, maybe can you hear me I'm available. I can. Hearing this question, otherwise. Can you hear me, Lauren? Yeah. Hello, Lauren. Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. Hi. Oh, yeah. Okay. Good. 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 Uh, it's a nice question. All uh, as I try to, I try to communicate. And my, also, my Ethiopian colleague was communicating. Uh, all the sources for uh, the sugar plantation are from surface water. The big rivers we have uh, twelve basins. Uh, the sugar uh, development projects are, uh, as you said, they are in the lowlands. These lowlands are uh, the convergence of uh, uh, lots of uh, river flows and also the sediment load is uh, lying over, uh, over the lowlands. So all the, the source of water for the mega sugar projects are uh, the big rivers. It's all the surface water source. Uh, but there is a plan, there, there is a planned activity to use uh, groundwater for sugar development in the future. In the GTP1 and GTP2, sugar was also in the plan to abstract, to irrigate about 2 million hectares of land, not only for sugar plantation, also uh, for a kind of mixed red culture. It's also in the plan, but not yet uh, is implemented for sugar cane. That's my, that's my answer. Thank you, Taya. We really appreciate that. Um, I know as as water becomes more scarce, it's it's always a in-demand resource. So having diversified um, sources of water is important. Uh, the next question for the application of water. It's a very interesting question, uh, but I don't have an answer in my head. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether there is uh, any plan, but. There are a lot of works uh, going on. In fact, uh, well, uh, 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 I mean, as partly as a research, for instance, there are already few publications which compared vapor uh, in Africa. Even though there is a recent publication that compared uh, the ET of vapor uh, across the whole Africa. Maybe I will check it uh, and then try to yeah send the link. Otherwise, uh, yeah, there is no one from ours just immediately now that uh, we are going to do it. But indeed, yeah, there are things uh, happening. Right, thanks, Bebe. And the next question, uh, I think, is for Martin. Uh, can one and the same sugar factory process both sugar beet and sugar cane? Um, yes, with, with some, some minor adaptations. Um, once you are at, at, at the, the, the juice level, the process is, is exactly the same. The, the pre-processing is, is slightly different. But there are companies who developed a hybrid system which can deal with both crops 
the name of the company is is the Smet. I think I think it's it, it's it's in the brochure that I that I mentioned before. Uh, so indeed, a cane factory cannot a cane processing factory cannot just start uh, processing sugar beet. Some some small modifications to to the system are needed, but there are solutions that enable dealing with with both crops. And then uh, a question about the first. I know. Uh, first, the second. How how developed it is. It, it it's available. Uh, in fact, for the tropical beet concepts, we could build further on 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 the varieties that we had already in in countries like Egypt and Chile and just further improve it a bit so we didn't have to start from scratch we just had to to fine tune it for 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 the local environments and regarding the region in India i'm afraid i don't know the answer to this so it's my my expertise in the company is the drought topic the tropical beat topic uh I'm not very, very much involved in. I can transfer the question to one of my colleagues who follow that closer and, and come back to you with an answer. So I don't know who asked the question, but you're always welcome to send me an email and, and I can follow up if needed. Okay, yeah. Great. And we can also put a link to your company website for information in the, bro in the brochure as well. Uh, next is, is more of a comment from Pooja, but uh, she's talking about how, um, for example, in, in India, they, where they were planting sugarcane intensively, they're moving towards uh, more diversified crops, which would improve food security and, and water productivity and flexibility in years of drought. Um, I think this is a, a nice topic. I don't know, maybe Taya or Peter, somebody who's familiar with this topic, is, is this something that's also happening in Ethiopia, for example, or, or other sugar cane? Diversified crop pattern? I find this very difficult to answer. But you see in the Inkomati, which I mentioned mm -hmm. in, in, on the South African side, uh, you have... Uh, okay. But you see in the in the Inkomati on the which is a river that is shared between South Africa, Swaziland, or Eswatini and uh, Mozambique, you have a lot of uh, sugarcane, but you also have a lot of uh, forest plantations which are rain fed, but they consume blue water, and you have a lot of uh, fruit trees. So they are really locked into everything that is perennial, and uh, so moving from uh, one perennial to the other may increase the value, for instance, from from sugarcane to to fruit trees or something. But uh, they'll still keep you locked in. So perhaps uh, to try out a bit of uh, the sugar beet, tropical sugar beets, could, could be an interesting uh, experiment, actually. What is I, I do know if people are interested in this topic, it will be covered next week in our socioeconomics around water productivity, where Wacheningen will discuss the trade-offs between different kinds of agricultural production and what it means for things like food security and water security. Um, so I think it is a difficult question to answer, and it might be case-specific. But again, we encourage you to join us next week, um, as that we'll, we'll get into more details on that topic. 
So I think there were a few more questions, but um, I think we're about 15. Oh, okay, let's do this. We'll have this as our last question from Pasquale. Um, this is for Bebe talking about his analysis with Wapor. Uh, I think we're in a realm of high position Thank you, Pasquale, for the uh, This implies vision. that you need a high yeah, It's uh, an honor to have you here. Uh, in fact, uh, we didn't really measure the degree of less accuracy, but what we did is that, that at least we have some sort of confidence with this data. We agronomically test if they make sense or not from 2009 up to now, and then we removed or I didn't present the data between 2009 up to uh, 2000, end of 2013. It's because, uh, well, uh, the era at least we couldn't confirm uh, from the uh, agronomic explanation. But then directly answer to your question, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, just still the accuracy and the comparison need to be done. And I would recommend the, just only the, 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 the procedure to be applied. Maybe Peter want to say something, please? Yes, because the plan is that your presentation will be triangulated with the crop yield data from the from the estate. But we haven't had the permission yet to use those data. And they measure water application very badly in the Shinavan estate. But in all uh, sugarcane uh, mills that I know, the crop yield is very accurately measured, both uh, the, the, the cut and burnt cane as well as the sucrose uh, content per lot. And uh, so that will be very valuable information. But so we, we Abeb is going to share the, the, the paper as it is now with the Shinavan company, with the request whether they can also share uh, crop data for certain plots just to check uh, the, the... Yeah, thank Great. Thanks, everyone, uh, for your answers. I think we, we're about 15 to 20 minutes over. Um, if we have unanswered questions, we'll take a look at them and put them on the website and send them around to, to our expert panel for their answers. So again, we want to thank everyone that was on the panel for your presentations and your videos. We really appreciate um, learning from you today. And again, a really big thank you to our participants, especially those who stayed a little bit late for the question and answer session. If you would like to rewatch this webinar, you can go to the project website, uh, waterpip.un-ihe.org or the waterchannel.tv. You can also download the presentations, and we'll put up additional information uh, on those locations as well. Now, when you exit the webinar, it will send you to the survey. Again, it's a, it's a survey that gives us more information about what you're interested in learning and who you are. And if you have filled it out already, thank you. You only need to fill it out once. But if you're new, we would really appreciate it if you completed it for us. So 